This is Tim Singer from Dead Guy and Bitter Branches, and you're listening to The New Sea Life. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with a brand new episode. And in the guest host chair today, I've got Trevor Graham of Chainslap. Trevor, welcome to the show. Keith, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Get, I'm ready to like get into it. We are going to get into it, and we are going to get into it hard. Now, Trevor is the creator of Chainslap. Trevor, tell the people about Chainslap. Chainslap is, uh, in a way, kind of similar to the hard times slash the onion, but is specifically about the sport of mountain biking. Yes. And if you haven't followed them on Instagram, check them out at Chainslap News. And speaking of the hard times, we've got a great guest for you on this week's show, Bill Conway of the hard times. Now, if you don't know the hard times by now, you must be living under a rock. It's the premier fake punk rock news site. I've been following it, I think, probably right around the the time that they started. You know, I was a big fan of The Onion when that first came out. And then, you know, when the hard times hit, when they first started, didn't really seem like there were these kind of more niche versions of The Onion. And and the hard times really kind of scratched an itch I had uh, (laughs) for fake satire news about the hardcore scene for sure. Oh yeah, big time. There wasn't really anything else like that. I remember discovering Hard Times sometime in 2017-ish. Someone sent me one of the articles and I thought it was real. And I was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. This is stupid because that's what I used to say to everything and sometimes still do. And my friend was like, hey, stupid. It's fake. Like It's like the onion. And I was like, oh, now I understand. And I've been a fan ever since. And this conversation with Bill is great. We covered all the history of the hard times, some of the great things they're doing over their platforms they've created to help writers and uh, crazy stories about stand up and embarrassing things we've done. This conversation's got it all, and that's coming up momentarily. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Now, I'm just going to focus on the two things I want the most this week. Number one is followers on Instagram. That's my main hub. That's where I am most of the time. So follow me at New Scene Pod and Apple Podcast and Spotify reviews. Now, listen, everybody, I check out some of the other podcast pages and some of these smaller podcasts have like hundreds more reviews. I don't know how they do it. I don't know where they come from. I don't know if their audience is just more supportive, but I need more reviews. So open up your Apple Podcast application, hit that five-star button. In Apple Podcasts, you can write a review. So if you write a nice review, I'll read it on the air. And you can also rate in Spotify. So open your Spotify application, go to the new scene, hit the five-star button. Give it six stars if you can. I mean, (laughs) if you can. Hack the system. And don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Now, there's a lot going on at Iodine. Attempt Survivors are playing a gig at St. Vitus, May 21st, with Error Type 11, Somerset Thrower, and Pilot to Gunner. That is one stacked bill. And if you haven't heard Attempt Survivors yet, you need to. They've got a single out on Iodine Recordings now, and here's a chance to see them on an unbelievable show. Also, there's a new line of Iodine merch that just dropped, and it all looks really good. It's my favorite. It's a lot of black with white ink. That's all I wear. They've got two new shirts and a hoodie. They look really good. Pick something up. I've got the beanie. I've got the t-shirt. I wear them all the time. And One Line Drawing has a new video out for their video, Don't Give Up. That's from their latest record, Tender Wild. The single is great. The album is great. Give it a listen. For more updates, head to iodinerecordings.com or check out their Instagram at iodine recordings. And last but not least, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, Bridge Nine Records. Listen, you've got to stop by the record store at 282 Rantoul Street. That's in Beverly, Massachusetts. And it's open every Wednesday through Sunday 
starting at 11 a.m. Did everybody see the video Chris posted on the Bridge9 Instagram? That's one nice display they've got there. They've got mugs, they've got books, they've got records, they've got a fine selection of punk releases, they've got a fine selection of Bridge9 releases, they've got the Bridge9 Silver Series pressings of some of their most famous releases, and you can only get those at the record store. And when you go to the record store, you may even see Chris Wren himself, and you can ask him, Chris, are you happy the Eagles lost the Super Bowl? And he'll probably say yes, because I know he's a huge Boston sports fan. For more information, head to bridge9.com. That's bridge the number 9.com. Or check out their Instagram at bridge9. That's bridge N I N E. Okay, Trevor. Yeah. Let's talk about what we are listening to. And I want to hear from you first because I'm tired of talking. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, give those vocal cords a rest. Let's see. What have I been listening to? Uh, well, you know, at the start of every year, I like to start le- up like a whole yearly kind of playlist. And we're already, you know, what are we, mid-February right now? And I've already got like 25 plus songs on here. So I think 2023 is starting off pretty good, at least musically. What I've really been listening to probably the most is um, this band Life on Venus. Kind of shoegazy, a little little shoegazy, a little hint of gothness kind of creeping in there, but with like some heavier guitar parts. The bass just has this like nice like flangey kind of like early cure kind of sound, just like very much in my my wheelhouse. Highly recommended that one. Uh, what else? What else might I listen to? Oh, this band Simulacra, kind of on the total opposite end of Life on Venus, like kind of like that new, like hectic kind of hardcore, kind of like Vein, kind of a lot like Vein, I would say. Maybe nice. a little, little tougher, a little more tough guy ish, but like you know, like the the vocals have that kind of like little bit of distortion on them, almost like the levels are peaking. It just I don't know, sounds like raw, uh, super good. Super heavy. The thing I'm probably listening to the most, though, honestly, is something that came in the mail recently, which is the Botch We Are the Romans vinyl reissue. That record, I mean, that's now, what, 24 years later? That record still is just like banger after banger. Still sounds so like new and innovative and I don't know, just unlike, unlike anything else. You know, a lot of that stuff from that time period, I can't. I have a hard time revisiting or I'll revisit for like nostalgia reasons. This I'll like actually still listen to. Yeah, that's one that is timeless. I don't know how they did it. I don't know what it is, but it's just perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, yeah, there's. I, I need to check out uh, some, you know, I, I will tell you uh, to our listeners, Trevor, I steal a lot of his picks from, from an unnamed message board that we post on and pass them off as my own because Trevor and I are like locked in on our musical taste. So I trust your taste always, Trevor, and I am interested in checking out those first two bands that I have not heard yet. Yeah, Life on Venus, Simulacra. Here is what I'm listening to. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. I'm going to write it down, actually. I've been digging back into the Renee Hartfelt discography. Ooh, yeah. They have a dis- they have a, like a discography thing out now that has everything, plus some acoustic tracks, plus a couple unreleased tracks. I'm really into the song Picasso again, so I've been listening to that. And there's an acoustic version of the Melodramatic. Mm-hmm. I really like that a lot. I've been listening to that. Uh, I've been listening to the song After Midnight by Blink-182. Again, I don't know. It just it just crept back in. That's that, a really is that good an one. Old one or is that a new one? That's from the album Neighborhoods. That's the last Mark and Tom album before Tom left the band. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I realized I hadn't really heard that record, and I was like, wait, there's like a whole record I haven't heard. So I went back, and that song really jumps out to me. And I listened to I'm listening to Don't Give Up by One Line Drawing because the video just came out, and the other night, uh, you know, it's a really upbeat song and. I was just listening to it, feeling all happy and like thinking about how good things are and thinking about the past and the song fit the moment perfectly. So I definitely recommend that one. Are they, is one line drawing? Are they, they're That's still Jonah around? from Far. Right. And they're still around? They're still yes. doing stuff? Wow. All right. Yes. He just came out with a new album wow. on Iodine Recordings. Hmm? Hmm? Hey. <laughs> 
Hey. Well, listen, check back in with me and Trevor in segment three. We're going to talk some more. We're going to run down the many things Trevor has been involved with. We're going to talk more about Chain Slap. We're going to talk more about ourselves. But right now, we are going to speak to Bill Conway of The Hard Times. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Bill Conway. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, Bill, it's wonderful to have you here. You know, you have built yourself quite an empire with the hard times. You've got a lot of stuff going on. I can't wait to dig into all of it and talk to you about all of it. But first, Bill, let me ask you, how are you doing today? Uh, today, on this very day, I am uh, I am rather well. You know, it's a, I'm in Los Angeles. It's been very rainy. Uh, but other than that, I live right by the L.A. River, so I get to see the raging L.A. River one time a year. And this is that time of year right now. The L.A. River, what is that? Uh, so at one point, uh, it was a legitimate river that I pa- apparently would flood most of Los Angeles. But then they, you know, at the end of Greece, where they're driving down... Uh, the, the cars on like the banks of, uh, you know, when they're doing that drag race at the end of Greece, um, you know, yeah. it, that's the LA river. Uh, that's, there's a small puddle of water that flows through Los Angeles. And when it rains, all of that drains into this man-made, uh, reservoir that used to kind of runs along what the river used to be apparently. And, uh, yeah, so it's just a giant man-made river in a way. Is it that same th- thing in Terminator 2 where the car the car chases? Yes, exactly. It's a different part of it. I think that's more towards Highland Park. I might be way wrong. And yeah, but uh yeah, I- I'm at a point where there's a lot of uh skate spots over here uh that are pretty legendary for skateboarding right on the river and um yeah, it's just uh it it it's the one it's part of it's a bird sanctuary where I live. So it doesn't look like complete shit. You know, it's like uh, actually got some vegetation in there and it's, it's, it's nice for uh, how shitty uh, the LA river can actually be when there's no water. (laughs) You still skate right to this day. I do. I've been a little slow lately because I've been dealing with old man injuries, uh, which have piled up, but yeah, I'm still uh, skating as much as I can. Isn't that scary to be at our general age and to have all of these injuries, but to still skate? Uh, I wouldn't say it's it's scary. It's frustrating in a way of like a, I don't know, you compare it to um, to bands, I, I suppose, where they're, they're getting older and they believe they're writing their best stuff. And everybody's like, no, nah, it's actually, a, you were better uh, 20 years ago, where it's the similar thing. Like my mind is like, I know I can do all these tricks. And then my body's just like, uh Oh no, you can't! And uh, here's an injury to prove it. And uh, that—that's what I'm dealing with. Is uh, everything makes sense to me in my brain, and then my body will not cooperate. That does make sense. Yeah, it's a passion thing. Yeah, exactly. So, Bill, you grew up uh, in Los Angeles. No, I grew up in uh, Hanson, Massachusetts, uh, the home of Ocean Spray, cranberries, uh, and, and all that good stuff. So, I am a Massachusetts guy. Is Ocean Spray a big thing in that town? Do they push the the cranberry juice and all the variants on people? Uh, you know, not so much when I was growing up. I think it had all moved out of there. The original, like Ocean Spray factory, then became. This is, you know, from what I understand, I might be wrong here. Some Hanson historian might be able to tell me otherwise. But it also it became practice studios for a lot of bands that were around at the time, and apparently porn studios which is just a rumor that teenagers made up possibly but maybe there was porn filmed in there you never know i i don't know i didn't look through the vhs tapes that were stored in the the closets of that place wow porn studios yeah you don't imagine porn being filmed in hanson massachusetts you i imagine los angeles and those houses on the hills and that kind of setting yeah it's it's not exact I, I they say hanson is the uh the valley of massachusetts so basically all of the 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 most prolific porn stars of Massachusetts ended up in Hanson at some point, uh, it, it, or maybe not. I, I I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about growing up there. I mean, I'm interested in your relation to the punk scene. Did you start going to shows there? Did you start uh, cutting your teeth as far as punk and all of that stuff goes in Hanson? Yeah, Hanson's like 40 minutes south of Boston, so it's uh, one commuter rail train ride away, uh, and and with the recording studio, well, the, the practice space, it wasn't recording studios, there's a practice space called Priority Music. So everybody 
bands from all of the South Shore would kind of use that as their practice space. So there was, you know, rumors that Aerosmith was in there every now and again. They weren't. Aerosmith had better <laughs> uh, practice spaces than uh, old Ocean Spray Factory. But uh, my first show was in Hull at the C Note, a uh, little dive bar. It was Big D and the Kids Table. And it was co headlined by a band, Waltham, uh, which was kind of like a cock rock band. Like it was a ska show, but then all of a sudden there was like bar moms that were coming out of nowhere. And I was like, who are all these older women? You know, they might have been in their 20s, but when you're 16, everybody just looks way older. So, uh, I, they just there was like oh older women are here and they were dancing to this Waltham band I don't know if Waltham ever went on to do anything but uh, they covered Jump by Van Halen that was really all I remember of them but yeah first show was a big D in the kids table show so uh, but I wasn't a big ska fan it was like I went with a friend of mine I was kind of into uh, you know the Victory Records stuff at the time because I had a friend well, a cousin that was a uh, that turned me onto that stuff pretty young yeah d- that was my thing too the more metallic hardcore stuff and uh i came up when all of the um the really technical stuff was happening botch dillinger escape plan uh i guess you could lump cave in in there as well converge so that was that was really my thing right yeah i think we're probably uh around the same time frame then because that's a probably i mean i unfortunately discovered botch when they re- released anthology of dead ends so I, it was a uh, unfortunate for me but uh we'll be seeing them in february so you know all all worked out that's pretty exciting, right? Yeah, I, I'm super excited for that. Cannot wait. Yeah, I did see Botch once back in the day, but I don't really remember the show at all because it was, uh, I don't know, subtract two, 2023 from 1998. I can't really do it that fast. It's 25 um, years. Th- there you go. And I got into a car accident on the way home. It was like my first time driving in the city. So I really remember the accident and the aftermath more than... Uh, the actual bot show. So you're saying head trauma might have made you forget what uh, had happened previously? I don't. It, th- th- that makes sense. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. It's it, it's a real sad state of affairs because uh, you know it's botched for God's sake. Yeah, that's too bad. Uh, that's too bad. But uh, are you going to be going to the reunion show in February? Yes or no? No. Uh, that's unfortunate. Wait, isn't that in? Uh, isn't that in Seattle? It is. It is. Yeah, I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for. Uh, St. Vitus gig because I live pretty close to there and I know it's going to happen. I, I mean, I'm not, all right, to, to the listeners, I don't know as in I've been told or really know, but I know it, it has to, it just has to. It would make the, if they're playing a Seattle show, they're going to hit some big markets and I would have to assume New York is on the agenda. But uh, again, I, I'm not the booking agent for, for botch. I, I don't know anything, but it would make the most sense. Plus Dave, the guitar player posted when he was looking for his guitars old guitar setup on instagram he said i need it for some stuff i'm doing next year hmm? mm, huh? interesting what could that be yeah yeah i mean huh yeah that <laughs> he's he's he might have been giving a little bit too much away there <laughs> so did you go to a lot of shows in boston uh you know at around that time when i was first getting into it um a lot of the shows were not in Boston, but you would be able to go to like the Kingston Knights of Columbus, you know, the uh, or whatever, whatever suburban VFW halls, uh, you know, a lot of shows in Taunton uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so spread out all over the South Shore of Massachusetts uh, and some North Shore stuff. You'd go to Club 123 in Haverhill uh, when a friend had a car. But typically shows just weren't in boston all that much from my recollection because by this point the rat was long gone so you're just doing the the vfw hall circuit and so we went to a lot of those shows that makes sense we had the same thing in pennsylvania there was a lot of incredible shows happening in bucks county and well there was a lot happening in philadelphia too but we had like our own thing going on in the suburbs too yeah i i feel like it's a little bit scrappier you know you got you show up all the lights are on the entire time you, you can't beat it Oh, actually, the the main place I think saw a lot of shows in Boston eventually was uh, the Elks Lodge, which is, you know, I think they call it Hardcore Stadium these days, apparently, when they book some things. But saw a lot of shows there. That was kind of later on in my 20s, as opposed to, uh, you know, those those early 15, 16 uh, year old years. So as you're growing up in Massachusetts, what do you want to do? Because, I mean, clearly you did not 
make a career out of music, but maybe you wanted to be in a band. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to trace you moving to Los Angeles and uh, starting up the hard time. So, what were you doing in Massachusetts, and what was your plan if you had one? Uh, yeah, you would, you would be very tough to trace me to Massachusetts based on anything, or to Los Angeles based on anything creative. Um, growing up, I uh, came from a very working class family. Uh, I got ended up doing very well. I went to a vocational high school uh, for, and I studied electrical stuff. So I was studying to be an electrician. Uh, got a couple of years of, of an apprenticeship uh, under my belt, which I've done nothing with. So those, all that work is out the window. But uh, I had a full college scholarship, which I ended up dropping out of college. I it was, it's a whole thing. Uh, there was uh, miscommunications. It ended up losing the scholarship on like a technicality because of an advisor basically saying, "Oh, you're fine," and then not having enough credits, and then the school being like, "You don't have enough credits. You don't have a scholarship anymore." It was it was bullshit. Probably could have fought it, but at the time and having no family members that have ever been to college before there was nobody to be like wait what what about this and so ended up working at electrical supply houses for uh most of my adult life i was working in warehouses for like 15 years from like ages 18 to 33 various warehouse jobs started in massachusetts uh and then i had a friend of mine that just said one day like hey you want to move out to san francisco when I was like 22 or 23, I was like, yes, let's do that. And so I just pre- basically on a whim moved to San Francisco when I was 23. Wow. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, f- the friend had been planning on moving. His roommate dropped out because the person he was going to move with ended up being working for the arcade fire. And so he went on to tour the world multiple times over with that band. And uh, my friend needed a different roommate. So we moved out to San Francisco. Was that scary at all? thinking back it should have been but it wasn't you know like uh it, it was my logical brain now i think like why the hell would i do that like we did i had barely any savings um because i'm 22 at the time and living in boston i didn't have a job that was exactly like this is a desirable thing that anybody can just transfer to a different big city and it was at the beginning of what would become the San Francisco tech boom, which I believe is now kind of on the downside. But 2000, we're talking 2006, 2007. That's when things started to pick up there. So rents were just spiking. You know, we would show up to uh, some sort of like open house or something like that. Like, hey, you know, it's a two bedroom in the shittiest part of San Francisco. And there's a line out the door of like 70 people and guys cutting to the front of the line being like, hey, I'm a doctor. Uh, I own three law practices and my daughter wants to rent this place. I'll pay uh, $500 more cash per month if you let us sign the lease right now. And then we're sitting there with no jobs being like, okay, I guess we will leave. Uh, So (laughs) that was the rental market we were dealing with. But uh, luckily, some landlord kind of just like took pity on us and was like, he had moved from Denmark or something like that and was like, oh, you guys are crazy. I was crazy once and he let us rent an apartment. So without without that guy, we'd probably be it probably would have been a lot worse. Ugh. I've been in that situation too. I tried to move the summer after the pandemic. Uh and it was like that in New York City. I'd show up to a viewing, there'd be a line out the door, they'd be like, Oh, it's roach infested and there's no sink in the bathroom, but uh it's great. And I I just <laughs> gave up. And stayed where I'm at. (laughs) Yeah, I I had two friends that had moved to New York during the pandemic uh, when everybody had been fleeing. And one of them lived on the Upper East Side. One of them lives on the Upper West Side. And when the pandemic ended and rent started to go back to their previous rates, my friend on the Upper East Side, his rent almost doubled. Maybe like it might have been a $2,500 hike. Uh, So he had to move out to a different part of the city and my friend on the upper west side luckily he was able to just get away with like a uh you know a rent increase that is human you know where it's like okay well we can deal with this but still uh but yeah new york definitely seemed crazy after the pandemic yeah you can't get anything real i mean like you can get like a kind of shitty okay apartment for two grand i guess but if you want something really good you're we're talking three grand minimum close to at least just for a one bed or are we talking a two bed here one bedroom. Oof, baby, that's uh yeah, that's that is rough. That is rough. Uh yeah, that's but that's New York, you know? Uh I, yeah, I, I everyone do wants in- to be here for some reason. <laughs> I I I don't understand how rent works and how 
uh, it, it, this is legal at this point, but hey, that's a that's for the capitalism podcast. Yeah, we'll get into that later, or no, probably not. But yeah, it'll be the bonus episode where we discuss capitalism and uh, landlords, slumlords, and uh, various uh, other real estate holdings. Yeah, so I, w- I I would like to discuss that. These are topics that interest me. So uh, everybody, after this interview, head to my Patreon. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't have one, so it's fine. But uh, so all right, so you're in San Francisco. What do you do? I mean, like you get a you get an apartment by chance. Like, what job do you get? Do you have any sort of idea what you want to do? I mean, walk us through this. Yeah, so land in San Francisco. I have a friend that had moved out there about a year before, so uh, we ended up crashing on his floor for over a month. We overstayed our welcome, you know. Like he had roommates, we're sleeping on his floor, and he's kind of. Uh, as politely as possible, like kicking us out the door, you know, without putting us on the street, you know, so we we eventually at the very last, you know, we finally find that landlord that gives us a chance. Uh, And at this point, I'm still looking for a job. The only job I had before was, like I said, working in an electrical supply warehouse. So I applied to a bunch of those. uh, And I ended up getting finally getting a job at this place called Independent Electric Supply, which uh, my first paycheck came on the very first day that my rent was due at the new apartment. So like, it was like perfect timing where I had a job for as long as humanly possible without needing it. And then finally was able to get it. And that, that warehouse was, uh, deep in San Francisco by the, uh, the AT&T ballpark where the giants play, then eventually moved deeper into San Francisco by a world famous skate spot called third and army, which is a spot that I skated every day on my lunch break, which is like, any skateboarder of a certain age would be like, that is like the dream scenario. And it was, I got to skate there every single day and see so many different pro skateboarders and just hang out there and, uh, just on my lunch break or after work every day. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that city. Uh, the, the first time or not the first, the first time I was there was like 2002 and I don't really remember it. I was on a tour with a friend's band, but I did, I do remember liking it a lot, but then I went later and I was just shocked at how much debauchery was out on the open in the streets. Like I was walking by city hall and I saw guys like loading up needles and there was just, you know, everything was very out in the open. And I was like, I like this. I like this. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, that, that city hall area is kind of on the edge of like what they call like the tenderloin, which is definitely the most raw part of San Francisco. Like when we first were looking for apartments there, it was like, that's, where the cheapest apartments were so we got to see um a lot it's like oh this is this is uh this is the city for sure yeah that un plaza area that's one of the only places i managed to buy drugs on the street successfully uh back in my uh, wilder days successfully in the sense like you didn't get robbed after or something like that exactly they were real I didn't get robbed. Uh, it was a success. You, you can't beat that. No, I, and I, I will always appreciate uh, UN Plaza, that area, for that. I got I got threatened by a guy with a needle uh, over skate across UN Plaza. I it is uh, the San Francisco Library, and um, I was skating there one night. It's a pretty famous skate spot, and a uh, person of the streets uh, was not happy that I was skateboarding and threatened me said you want to get AIDS and then put a needle in my face and said he will stab me with it and uh, oh my god yeah, that was that was a good time um, always always good to you know I, I didn't want to call his bluff you know it was one of those things like hey well I'll just I'll just take your word for it and the answer to your question is no I don't want AIDS but thank you for asking before jabbing me with it <laughs> That was going to be my follow-up question. Did you, in fact, want AIDS? Yeah, not not at the time. No, still no, to this day. Um, But yeah, thankfully, I I think he was bluffing. Uh, Then a cop came over and just basically told me and the other skateboarder that were there, like, this guy's lost his mind. He thinks uh, you're tracking him with your cell phones, and he wants to stab you. And I'm like, all right, yeah, that's fair. That's enough. That would be enough for me to to call it a night. Yeah. (laughs) So you're in San Francisco. You're working at an... Uh, a new electrical supply warehouse like what happens next let's see uh eventually i started doing stand-up comedy uh in san francisco there's a pretty world f- at the time it's gone now but there was like a world famous open mic it was called brainwash and it's where everybody in san francisco kind of started if you're of a certain age like ali wong started there and she's obviously like a superstar stand-up comedian these days 
but uh, it was just in a laundry mat slash cafe. And you would go, you'd wait in line for two hours, you'd sign up, you'd do three minutes of very bad material, and then you would you would leave. And so it started with stand up there. And I did stand up in the city for two years, very poorly, um, never been a good stand up comedian. And then my wife and I who I had met in San Francisco, we decided to move up to Portland, Oregon, because we were living in a place in San Francisco that was a super small apartment, like a one bedroom that was completely diagonal. Like if you put a marble on the floor, it would just like rocket to the other side of the room. And it was outside of a wine bar. So every Friday and Saturday night, without fail, I'd have to get up and open the window and tell somebody that's like breaking up out in front of our apartment, like, hey, can you break up on the other side of this place like we're trying to sleep in here <laughs> and all you need to do is go to the other side where there's no houses um <laughs> but yeah so eventually we realized we were getting priced out of the city because now we're in like peak tech boom you know like peak tech uh th- there's no moving around san francisco at this point and uh we moved up to portland and that was another one of those moves where it's just like we don't know anybody there really we'll, ju- we'll just do this she's from alaska and she had moved to san francisco similarly and once you move away once it's just easy every time after that because it's like you're already like well the hardest time is leaving your home yeah yeah exactly and so you're doing stand-up in san francisco did you like it at all like how did were you going like every night when you were doing it so at first i honestly so i didn't have any friends that did stand up or anything like that and i honestly didn't realize it was one of those things like oh i should be doing this every night i did it like once a week for the first year i was also doing like yeah. improv classes which i i didn't really love uh improv all that much um and then eventually when i started to like become friends with more stand-up comedians I was like oh right you guys are going out every night like two or three times i need to start doing this more and then when i moved up to portland i kind of ramped it up a little bit and was doing more stand-up in portland and once we landed there it's when i started up a podcast called edgeland where i interviewed people that were straight edge or formerly straight edge and um that's kind of that's you know stand-up was like the start but that podcast was kind of where I started meeting more people, which would eventually lead to the hard times. It was through that Edgeland podcast. Okay. What year? Uh, wait, before I get to that. Yeah, stand up. I used to do stand up and I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know you're supposed to go like every single night to really hone the craft and just throw jokes out there. And I was so racked with anxiety. I, like you, I was only doing it once a week and I never really... Yeah, I just didn't have the drive. I guess I was doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I, I feel like that's that's there, there's something about that where it's like I I thought I was doing it en- like once a week. I honestly thought I was doing it enough. Where it's just like, oh, I'm thinking about it all the other times, but then you go and you bomb, and you're like, okay, that feels really bad. Uh, that that's terrible. Why would I want to feel bad every night of the week? But instead of realizing like that makes you actually better, uh, because yeah. you're you're you just have to fail in front of people as much as possible and embarrass yourself publicly and tell your friends not to come watch you because uh, you don't want to put them through that. And uh, that's kind of what the first few years of comedy were, were definitely like, but yeah, it's uh, it is a grind. One time I had friends come out and I, uh, the worst thing happened. I, I just, f- the first joke just didn't land at all. And I just, I just gave up and walked off. stage. <laughs> <laughs> and then we all met at the bar afterwards and I'm like, well, uh thanks for coming out really bad (laughs) and then another time i invited a uh this is even worse i invited a very rowdy group of friends to the show and they came and uh a a giant brawl broke out uh, at the open mic but between comics or between audience and comics uh audience and comics my friends in the audience fought several comics and uh well it was quite a scene and we're, are we talking like hardcore kid friends here, like real people that are not afraid to scrap or what kind of crew yes. are we rolling with? Yes, they they were banned from like everywhere, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one thing, you know, going through years of stand up comedy, there's a lot of. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a tough guy by no means. Uh, I'm, I'm not, but like there's a level of like, oh, well, I'm not a, like, afraid to actually fight somebody sort of thing like all right well if we have to do this we have to do this and so many comedians i feel like want to push people to the limit and then when 
sometimes they get to a person that is legitimately like, oh, I will actually fight you. You've made a mistake. And the comedian doesn't know what to do at that point. Because it's like, I thought we were all having a good time by me embarrassing you. Oh, fuck. And then they get their asses kicked. Uh, it's uh, I've seen it happen, you know, that you just push the wrong person. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not a fighter at all. I'm pretty weak. And, you know, these just happen to be friends of mine. But I'll never forget the host. One of the hosts was crazy and not afraid to fight. And I saw him squaring off like nose to nose with my friend who was crazy and not afraid to fight. And I I ran in. I was like, no, no, sit down. It's okay. And I'm like trying to like, I'm like trying to play mediator and pull people out. And but a little brawl broke out. But thankfully, there was no uh, serious injuries. But uh, it was quite exciting. Yeah, that's, it's probably an open mic people still reference every now and again, as opposed to the the doldrums of the open mics where nothing happens and everybody goes home unhappy. <laughs> so you're in Portland, you're doing the Edgeland podcast, yes? Yes. Around what year is this? 2013, I believe, is maybe 20, yeah, 2013 is probably when I started that up. Um, and yeah, and so I had been doing that for about, a year and then i had matt sankum on as a guest and he was he's the co-founder of the hard times but he was playing in a band called zero progress which was a bay area hardcore band we had not crossed paths when i lived in san francisco he's eight years younger than me maybe seven years younger than me so we just rolled in completely different circles and uh i i was not familiar with him until i had moved but we eventually struck up an internet friendship through the podcast and through his exploits. And eventually he had the idea to start the hard times. And through our internet friendship, we we got together and uh, made it a reality. So when does it get started and how does it get started? It started at the very end of 2014. So we just had our eight year, uh, you know, we just passed eight years as a, as an entity and he just kind of threw it out. I mean, people were still using, this is how old it was. It was people were still using Facebook to communicate at the time. So he had put out a post of like, hey, I'm thinking about starting something that's kind of like the punk onion, if anybody wants to be involved. And I, to say that I have, I was a huge Onion fanatic, you know, like living in San Francisco, they still had print copies of the Onion at the time. And so every Tuesday, as I'm on my way to work, I'm grabbing multiple copies of the hard copy of the Onion and reading every article while I'm at work. I still have the last print edition somewhere in a, in a closet. It's got Joe Biden washing his Camaro. Uh, I know that. But I remember picking it up and it had like, it was very thin. I was like, this this seems like a problem. There's no advertisements in here. And then sure enough, there was no print copies from then on. But all that to say, I was like a student of the Onion. So just that satire voice was kind of ingrained in my brain. I was like, oh, well, yes, this seems like a a welcome change, you know, and we can do it about this punk and hardcore scene that we have both come up in and there seems to be a vacuum here that nobody else is really doing this style of comedy that we can tell so let's let's give this a try so the end of 2014 we just would do like an article a day like five days a week and it started to get relatively popular kind of fast we were very surprised by it where did you initially start was it just on facebook or did you do like facebook instagram twitter so we started like we we made a hard website you know like the hardtimes.net so but everything we would put mainly facebook was our biggest platform everything would link back through facebook we had a twitter and then after like a year or two instagram was instagram had been around but we didn't really know how to use it to our advantage, but now that's our biggest platform through Instagram is where we have the most followers and the most engagement. So thankfully, we were able to figure that out. But yeah, it was mainly Facebook at the time and still Facebook's where most of our traffic comes from, even though nobody's really using Facebook all that much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I made it when my podcast started taking off and, you know, I connected with the label and all that stuff. I made a Facebook because I thought I should have one. And I post there, but that's it. I, I, it looks completely different from when I left it in 2015 and I have no desire to learn it. In fact, I made like a fake name because I'm like, I'm not doing this again. I'm not making a profile. I'm not adding all my friends again on another platform. I'm not doing it. So I just made it like kind of a fake name so I could make the, the podcast page. Yeah. Initially, when we, so the, the way the hard times like uh, headline generation works, we kind of have a lot of freelancers. We have them in a, 
a group uh, and it started on Facebook where we had like a private Facebook group where people could pitch headlines. And then let's say there's 200 people in this private group. We kind of had a democratic process of like, all right, so somebody uh, freelancer X pitches a headline and all the other freelancers can look at the headlines. And if they think that's funny, they can hit the like button. And then us as editors, we go through at the end of the week, see which headlines got the most likes from our contributors. And then, we approve that based on like the popularity. It's like, all right, well, if it's doing well in this small group of people, maybe it will do well in the greater um, area of, you know, our audience. But it got to the point where we're like, we do it through Slack now because we were trying, Facebook was limiting. Like if we mentioned, if we had a headline that mentioned screwdriver, then Facebook would flag us and be like, you're spreading hate speech in this private group and we're going to shut you down and be like, well, we're not. We just mentioned screwdriver um, in a satirical headline. And then there was also a lot of people we were trying to add to the group. We're just like, oh, I don't use Facebook anymore. And like, yeah, right. So we had to (laughs) bail out of there for for multiple reasons. But yeah, also they had these weird limitations. You know, I mean, there's far right groups on Facebook posting right now, but a niche hardcore punk site that occasionally mentions uh like stormfront in a mocking way we got flagged all the time <laughs> well that's the way it goes uh and i'm i'm sure that's on purpose you know yeah yeah without a doubt yeah but um so when you're growing the platform what do you do i'm curious about some of the process because like when i you know i started out on instagram And I would literally sit there and like go through and follow accounts. And I didn't realize you can't do more than like 50 of an action in a day or they'll start to nail you with like warnings and lock your account. And that happened to me. So I'd follow 50 accounts, see who followed back. And if they didn't, I'd have to comb through and unfollow them. And it was like this everyday agonizing process to like try to build up somewhat of an audience did you do anything like that or did the did people just find you because of the content uh for the most part people did find us in the early days of the facebook algorithm it was very favorable to us this was pre like if we're if we started in 2014 like so 2016 is when donald trump started to run for president when fake news became like a term you know so after that election is when facebook started cracking down on anything that they considered fake news. And a lot of times satire got wrapped up into that, even though we were not saying anything like we were just obviously joking around, but their AI or whatever could not de- determine between what is fake news and what is, uh, you know, just satire. And it got worse during the pandemic where, you know, if we were making jokes about COVID, where we would get flagged for COVID disinformation, where it's like, no, we're not saying the vaccine kills people, you know, like we're just, (laughs) uh, this is ridiculous. And so, but in the early days, uh, it was a lot of people following, like finding us, but also similarly to what you were mentioning, like I, I was still working a warehouse job. So I had a lot of time on my hands in between warehouse working and whatever and i had told my boss who was a young guy at the time i was like hey i do this thing and when there's no other work to be done you know if there's not a customer in here there's not an order to be pulled i'm just going to be doing this and he's like yeah yeah you are i hope you do do that and uh so i would go through facebook and if something like a post had a thousand likes then i would just click on that and see everybody who liked the post and i would invite them to like the facebook page you know so i was just sitting there clicking you know i think you could do 200 in a day on facebook so i was just clicking invite people to like this facebook page uh for hours on end every day during my downtime so that was an early thing but everything else has been much more like organic like instagram kind of just it just feeds itself i i don't know how it works it's just we're very lucky yeah yeah, you throw in the hashtags, you make a reel these days, and uh, the people find you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's still a mystery how their algorithms work, uh, and I still think we get pegged a little bit. I mean, there's been a couple times where they've threatened to delete our Instagram page uh, out of nowhere because of a headline we've run. But uh, other than that, it's it's usually an okay relationship. Yeah, I've seen you guys post and certain headlines will get flagged or posts taken down. That was going to be a question of mine. Like, I mean, you must be, I get nervous about that and I haven't had any problems since 
2020 when I was first doing this Instagram, but you guys have gotten a number of warnings, right? Yeah, I'm it, not not so much lately, but I don't know how many strikes and you're out sort of thing, but it, I always can test it, you know, like there's there's a way for you to be like, "Hey, Instagram, you've made a mistake, like reread this." And yeah. sometimes they've been like, "You know what? You're right. You, you, you we we fucked up. We should never have flagged you for this." That's happened a couple times. Other times they've dug in. Like there was one, let's see if I can remember the I, I'll be able to pull up the exact headline here, but it was when Derek Chauvin got convicted of murdering George Floyd. You know, so obviously there's a lot of um, emotions that are surrounding this. I think everybody was awaiting that verdict and being like, "All right, if this guy gets let go, like we're burning shit down again." Uh, so everybody was very relieved that Derek Chauvin actually got convicted, but that happened on April twentieth, four twenty which is also Hitler's birthday. So we ran a headline, Chauvin upset he isn't able to properly celebrate Hitler's birthday thanks to guilty verdict. And so <laughs> uh, the probably the celebrate Hitler's birthday and Derek Chauvin probably just pinged them and we got put in Facebook jail. You know, we were like shadow banned to the nth degree. They threatened to delete our Instagram page. And it's like, well, if you read this, this is not us saying we this is a bad person doing a bad thing you know like what don't you get about this but uh they you know it's whatever we have thankfully we've i wouldn't say we're on our best behavior but they haven't been overly critical or something like that we've we've been able to avoid some things lately so what happened with that headline did you have to take it down how did you how did you get out of facebook jail uh eventually i th somebody you know is actually Scott Crawford, he does the Salad Days uh, doc. Uh, we had him on the Hard Times podcast. He had a friend that worked at Facebook, and he's like, "Hey, I think I might be able to help." And I'm not sure if that, you know, his cousin or whatever that worked at Facebook was able to kind of like turn it off. But it seemed to slowly get better after that. It was almost like it might have been a timing thing. Like maybe it just expired. Like maybe when you're put in Facebook jail, it's a 90 day thing. I don't know. They don't tell you anything, you know, there's nothing. They just play by their own rules and, um, it's their platform so they can do what they want to do. And, uh, but we didn't take it down. We left it up. They, they took it down, you know, they, but w it's still on our website. You could, you can read it on the hard .net if you're, you're so inclined, but yeah, all, all evidence of it was scrubbed from Facebook. Isn't it crazy how these things are structured? Like everything is through these social media platforms now. And if they want, they can take you down in one fell swoop. And there's no way, there's no way to get in touch with them. Like when I've had issues in the past, there's no like Instagram customer service number. As far as I know, all you can do is click yes, no, or, you know, it's, it's just crazy how you could be deleted in an instant and there's not really anything you can do about it. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I always... Like when I hear people like right wing people complaining about being like deplatformed and all this and that, I'm like, oh shit, well, I'm kind of dealing with the same, same stuff. And we completely disagree, but like, you're all, you're a prick. Uh, and, uh, I'm not trying to be a prick, so you can still fuck off. But, uh, if you, if you happen to figure out how to fix this, let me know, you prick. <laughs> yeah. Right wing people are often mad at the right things, but for the completely wrong reasons. Yes. That's, that's. It, it like i mean even january 6th it's like well thanks a lot jerk wads you really ruined overthrowing the government for everybody you know like what the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you you were just going to install the same government but worse you know losers yeah that that was my thought too i was like but it's for donald trump yeah. no we're, we're doing this wrong we're doing this all wrong <laughs> right yeah it, if you want to if you like if you want a right-wing president i've got one for you his name is joe biden you know like get out of here i mean he's he's is uh he's not the radical liberal that they uh that they think he is like it, just insane no that that's another thing and look i could go on and on and i might but uh people like people in this country they love to talk about how other countries are brainwashed. Oh, North Korea, they're all brainwashed. We're no better. We're no better. We've we've grown up on uh we've grown up celebrating uh law enforcement, cowboys, police, uh military, we're indoctrinated with it. And people truly believe that uh I don't know, Democrats are good 
and Republicans are bad if they're like liberal people. And I, I don't, they just don't see the forest for the trees. And it, it hurts my soul a lot of the time. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So, um, all right. So we're building up the hard times. We are putting articles out there. How, what's the structure? Are you guys just doing this from home from your laptop still? Yeah. I mean, it's always been, uh, from just whatever computer I have access to, um, for, you know, I've always kind of been either the number one or the number two guy at the hard times. Right now I'm the, you know, currently the number one guy at the hard times. Uh, Matt is off doing other projects these days and, and working on, he's a type of person that, uh, is always trying to build and I am more of a trying to sustain guy. So, you know, I'm sustaining the hard times and he's building other platforms that he, he's interested in. But, um, yeah, it's always just been, you know, from a work computer when I was working in warehouses. And then as soon as I get home from the laptop and now I'm in Los Angeles, I've got a two bedroom and one of the bedrooms is an office and, uh, the other is where I sleep. And then that is it. Uh, and then we have a lot of freelancers and everything just kind of flows through, uh, the, the small team of editors that we have. So there's not like a hard times office somewhere, uh, outside of your apartment. There is not. Uh, and you know, even if we had that, the sort of resources there probably would never be, you know, it just seems like, uh, we've been doing this, uh, like this forever. Let's just keep it this way. Yeah. And who wants to go to an office? Like I worked from home before the pandemic, I work from home mostly after the pandemic. I can't ever go back. I can't. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I spend all day. I, I got a, I got a dog four years ago, spend all day with him. You know, I, I don't want to leave him for however many hours a day. You kidding me? I want to stay with my dog. Exactly. I, I'm in the comfort of my home. I can move at my own pace. I've got Twitch on one monitor. I've got my work on another. This is, I'm living the life over here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cheating, you know, but, uh, <laughs> Just, you know, hopefully nobody, uh, you know, just, just stay living on easy street for now. Uh, no, no offices work from home, even though working from home does have its downsides. It's, it's not all it's cracked up to be sometimes, but it's better than the alternative in my opinion. When do you and Matt really see hard times starting to take off? I think I saw my first hard times article in 2017. So that was like, that was when I became aware of it and became a fan of it. But when do you start to see things like really popping off? You know, it was it was really early on, like even in 2014, like we started in November, well, this late December of 2014. And we started, we put out a couple articles related to Christmas, you know, like one had like mentioned Black Flag or something like that. And one of the many singers of Black Flag, like reshared it on Facebook and we're like, holy shit, you know, like one of the guys from Black Flag shared this. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> It was relatively fast that we saw it. And then it was just kind of like, okay, how do we, we ride the wave and keep building and keep people interested? Because for the longest time, you know, I'm doing stand up comedy and I've got stand up comedy friends saying to me, how long, how many punk jokes are you going to be able to make? Like, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'll let you know when we run out. And, uh, you know, and now it's, you know, eight years later and we're still, you know, I, I'd say putting out quality material and uh, thankfully we haven't run out yet. The, the, the punk scene continues to deliver with its uh, ridiculousness sometimes. So we are able to, uh, to do that. Now it's just kind of like we've been around for eight years. People think we're like an established comedy brand and it's almost like, wow, I, this was never meant to happen this way. Yeah. And I think that's how these things happen organically you yeah. know you're not thinking oh i'm going to be the next onion in the punk world it's like no we have this idea we build it and then things happen yeah th there are people that sometimes try like ask my advice like oh how can i do like how can i build the hard times of you know x topic and it's just like you just start you know there's no other way like start and then be consistent and hopefully the audience that you think is there gravitates towards it and it, you can pick it up like there's no other advice you can give other than just do it and try and don't give up on it right away if it's not an immediate success just do it because you want to be doing it and not in if it's a burden on you and then there's nobody reading it then yeah give it up but if it's a something you enjoy doing then keep doing it and see what happens i think that's great advice so what you're saying yes number one you have to be passionate about it. Number two, there has to be an angle that, because, you know, if someone else just tried to do another hard times exactly, 
maybe or maybe it would go over, but maybe not. But finding an angle is important. And consistency is very important every week. Like it has to be your life, kind of. That 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 once uh, the pandemic hit, I decided to start making this podcast weekly. And this is what I do the most. This is where all of my energy goes. Everything else comes second. So I think if you uh, have that approach, then uh, you're going to be successful, hopefully. Yeah. And with the, on, on the consistency, you know, topic, if you start to build, you know, a group of people that become, you know, interested in what you're doing. And you, if we use the podcast example and you say, we have an episode every, a new episode every Tuesday. And then Tuesday comes along, they get to download that episode, they look forward to it. But then if you miss three Tuesdays in a row, then they go, well, fuck this, you know, like, I guess they're not doing this anymore. And uh, I will find a new podcast to fill that hour of my day. And, you know, similarly with whatever content you're putting out, you know, on whatever platforms you have to, you have to feed the beast. And the best way to do it is just be consistent, you know, and uh, make a schedule and stick to it. Exactly. So, Bill, since you're the number one guy at the hard times, do you ever have to make any hard choices? You know, like, does someone send in a shitty article and you got to be like, look, uh, we can't work with you anymore? Is there ever any issues you have to deal with? Like, what, what are you dealing with day to day? So, for the most part, it's, it's, th- there are those times where something like that comes up. Um, I, I'd sort of mentioned our pitch process where it's kind of democratic, where we have, All the freelancers can see every headline that is pitched and they can basically vote on it saying like, yes, that is funny. Then we do the editorial meetings. I'm in the meetings with a couple other people each week. And sometimes there's a headline that blows up in the group. Like people love it. Like it gets a a ton of likes. It's easily the star of the week. So the person that pitched that headline is obviously sitting at their house, right? Thinking at the end of the week, when the editors release the headlines that are approved, mine's going to be on there. But then we might have to make that tough decision of saying like, oh, we're passing on this one. Here's why. I know we know it was super popular in the group, but the reason we're passing on it is because if you actually look in 2004, The Onion did a headline exactly like this. You know, we're not saying you stole it, but uh, it's it, it, this joke's been done, or maybe it's just a terrible pun that some people find funny, but we don't as editors. It's like we're just not going to put out a pun headline, um, ro- regardless if the group says it's funny. So that's kind of the hard decisions we have to make. Is like disappointing some people that might have put their eggs in a basket of oh I'm going to get this approved and I'm going to get the uh, the you know that that hard times post up on the Instagram or whatever and can share it. Um, and there's been a couple of times where people have been had kind of mental breakdowns where the I wouldn't say the pressure of pitching for the hard times, but that frustration of I'm pitching these headlines and nobody likes my ideas. Clearly, it's a problem with all of you people. You guys are fucking stupid. And I I am a comedy genius and you don't appreciate me. And we have to like remove those people from the group and being like, OK, you're a problem you maybe creative endeavors aren't for you if you don't know how collaboration works um seek help yeah i've heard endless stories of like pitch meetings at snl some of the greatest comedy minds of our generation had skits that never got on yeah i mean it's, it's just it's just the way it goes sometimes yeah and uh yeah, there there have been people that have, you know, taken screenshots and shared them and tried to like smear the editors or whatever. And it's just like, you know, move on, dude, you know, like, and, uh. and, and all of when somebody writes an article for us, you know, there's every headline has a full article and we have the editors that read through them. We make the tweaks, like we put them in. And sometimes somebody submits something, a full article that's like way off base. Like we have a template, like I send everybody. It's like, here's how you write a hard times article. Follow these steps. It's very easy to just follow these steps and you'll be golden. But then they, they write something and it comes in. It's like almost like poetry. And you're like, wait, this is not, (laughs) this is not what we wanted. And then they are like, I'm, you don't understand. I'm a creative genius and you're wrong. It's like, no, (laughs) you're, you're wrong here. This is just not what we do. And it's just. And it's the advice I give anybody pitching anything. If you're if you're trying to write, you know, comedy for a living and you want to write for Jimmy Kimmel, like the late night show, submit a packet in the voice of Jimmy Kimmel. Don't submit a packet 
that like James Corden would like don't use carpool karaoke for a Jimmy Kimmel packet. You know, it's like write right. for in the voice that you are trying to write for. That's a very important thing in all comedy brands look for your understanding of their voice because they are just trying to keep their voice as the um as the driving force and i think the hard times has a particular voice that we try to stay con- consistent with no that makes perfect sense like when i imagine a hard times article right now in my head i can almost see the template and that's what i want i want that consistency so if i looked in it and it was like some i don't know haiku or or like something way off base, I'd be like, what happened? Right, right. Yeah. Somebody suffered a head injury uh, in the editorial staff. uh, And yes, (laughs) like this is clearly a mistake. Somebody hacked this. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, there have been people that have tried that. And thankfully, we have a, a, a fairly good, you know, right now, the the freelance uh, pool that we have, everybody's more or less kind of dialed in and on board uh, the editorial process can be fairly painless for most of them when they're submitting because we have our process kind of dialed in so so tightly at this point that's good who makes the decisions is it the one particular editor looking at the article or does everything funnel up to you like how does it work so we do the editorial meeting each week and we'll have three editors in the meeting and we all look at the headlines that have you know the group of the the general group has thrown their votes behind these headlines and there's a certain amount of likes that they get that will be the threshold like anything under this number we just disregard everything above this number goes into the editorial meeting and so we have a list every week of you know 20 to 100 headlines depending on how prolific the the group was that week and how active they were and we read through each one Each editor will put their initials behind a headline saying like, all right, I'm going to fight for this one when it comes to the the meeting. And then we have the meeting and we just kind of look over each headline individually that we have marked as this is a potentially good one. And it's kind of a two out of three. Like if two editors say yes, then we will go with it. If two editors say no, then it's disregarded. And that one editor just has to to sit on it. And um, that's kind of how we do it. It's just a majority rule sort of thing and a lot of times people will pitch headlines and it's just like hey this is a good headline but simpsons made this joke or this was the same thing uh, you know i just happened to watch father of the bride 2 the other day they made a very similar joke in father of the bride 2 uh so <laughs> we can't we can't run this joke and so a lot of times we're just passing on headlines because of that and i mean recently we we ran a headline uh and i mean i didn't even love the headline it did well in our group uh, but it turns out it, it was something like um, Dark Side of the Moon also syncs up with Paul Blart Mall Cop, something like that. And it turns out that that joke is something that this, these McElroy brothers do. They do like the My Brother, My Brother and Me podcast, which I do not listen to that podcast. I've n- maybe heard 30 seconds of an episode, but it's kind of this... Uh, this big thing where they talk about Paul Blart and dark side of the moon and none of nobody in the entire hard times pitch group, like commented on it saying, Oh, Hey, these guys actually do this joke. So we ran it. And then the McElroy, uh, side of the internet was just like, Oh, you're stealing jokes now. And it's like, wait, what are you talking about? And then when we we Googled it, it's like, Oh shit, they are doing this joke. All right. We have to delete this headline because, uh, these dorks are really coming after us and they're kind of (laughs) right. Yeah, well, that no, that's good that you can like, you know, like you see that it's already been done, so you just take it down. I mean, that that's I guess that's the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, we're not, it, we're not going to fight. There's parallel thought in so much that happens, uh, and but in this this case, it was just the uh, all right. Well, these guys have a whole uh, industry surrounding this joke. Uh, we should have maybe vetted this one a little bit better, but oh, well, let's, we'll just get rid of it. It's crazy how things, uh, just seep into your brain through osmosis as well. Like, um, that you don't even realize, like I repeat things that I don't even realize there's ideas from other things that I don't even realize. So th- as that's going to happen a lot, uh, in the creation of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we get, you know, pitches from people like we have an open email submission. People can pitch us, and like every day, I see somebody pitching a headline almost verbatim of something we've already done. You know, it's just like, oh, this is this is a good headline. We ran it in 2016. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I mean, it's a very big platform now. You have a lot of reach. What is, do you get hit up for a lot of things? Like what's, what's some of the crazier requests you've gotten? Um, you know, I, I, I tend not to look at too many of our, uh, messages because for the longest time, it was just people telling whoever runs the hard times to kill themselves, you know, like, cause we're doing a lot of, <laughs> you know, anti-cop stuff, you know, is always been our bread and butter. And that brings out the people with Punisher tattoos, um, and Punisher decals oh, yeah. and, and the black and white American flag. Exactly. And all, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so those people flood our messages telling us to kill ourselves. Uh, so we end up missing, you know, some of the things, but just through the hard times, like, I mean, I, I did a stand up show during the pandemic in Fat Mike's backyard from No Effects. That was a weird one, you know, which wouldn't happen without the Hard Times connection. Uh, so, how did that go? Uh, terribly. It was, <laughs> I mean, all right. So, describe that scene for us. Yeah. So, it was weekend at Fatty's, is what it was billed as. You know, like it was open, I think it was open to the general public, or maybe it was like an invite only thing. But the whole, thing was there was a bunch of fat records bands playing no effects was playing two heaps white trash and a bean all the way through which is an album i enjoy so i wanted to see them play that because i had not ever seen no effects play live before other than in fat mike's backyard and um then they were going to do we were going to do a comedy showcase after so it was going to be a hard times comedy show basically so i asked a couple of friends like hey do you want to do this show and we'll 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 perform at seven or whatever and then like nine o'clock rolls around and bands are still playing people are drunk and filing out and uh then they were just kind of like all right here's some comedy and it was just the worst setup where it was like oh you i'm not a huge fishbone fan but we had to follow fishbone and oh. there's no following them but like i i couldn't believe how good live they were like in the backyard in the middle of like the Valley of Los Angeles playing to like 60 people fishbone did like the best performance I've ever seen a live band play before. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I can't believe what we just saw. And then it was like, okay, now here's some, some dorks talking in uh, comedy for you. And <laughs> it was just, uh, bad. Every comedian did rather poorly, uh, me especially, but, uh, and we had strong comedians on that thing too. And, uh, but nobody was paying attention. Everybody was drunk. Fat Mike jumped in the pool during, mid- during the middle of somebody's set and was just kind of distracted everything. It was like, this was poor planning from the start. Like comedy should have happened first and then we should have been on our way. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was one of those comedy shows you drive home and just being like shaking your head the entire time and just being like, Oh God, well, why do we do this? <laughs> exactly. I don't think comedy and music is a good pairing because if you go second, what you just described happens. And if you go first, everyone just wants you off the stage so you can like, so they can hear the bands. That's typically how it goes, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if everybody's showing up to watch no effects play this album, full through for the for the last time ever then nobody cares about this comedian doing eight minutes about how online dating in los angeles is weird you know like <laughs> uh just like get off the stage let us see the bands play do you still do stand-up i've so during the pandemic i i got really used to just being at home and it's been very tough for me to get out and uh, be motivated to do stand-up and also i've I've never gotten, I still haven't gotten COVID. I'm one of the very few that's been COVID free. And um, so I, I don't really have that much of a drive. Like I'm busy with the other creative endeavors right now. So like that part of my brain is being fulfilled. I've, I've hosted a couple of comedy shows where I've done, you know, the hosting and performing part of it, but I haven't really dedicated time to stand up in the the way that i was in the past but i'm not closing the door on it but i'm also like at this point i'm not super hyped on it yeah you know that's kind of how i feel about performing music now i still do it i'm working on something but it's not my main priority just because this podcast and everything associated with it takes up so much time it's scratching that creative itch yeah exactly and i think everybody needs that uh and there's there's so many stand-up comedians that i see that only do stand-up and i almost want to give them the advice of like wait you need to do other things though in the comedy realm like do stand-up but also do this that's comedy related like you know 
don't just cut a 30 second clip of your set and then put that on Instagram and think that that's enough to build your brand or whatever you want to call it at, at this t- this time. It's like it, it, you have to do so much these days. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's all because we're just a slave to capitalism back to capitalism. This is the bonus episode. Uh, we're just go right back to that. capitalism, the police state and the brainwashing that takes place in this country. No, we won't look, we won't go <laughs> off on a tangent. We'll, we'll keep it a little light. So hard times has hard drive as well. Now, do you game? I, I don't. I mean, I, I'm casual, like extremely, extremely casual where like I'll buy one video game a year, play it until I'm sick of it and then move on. But we started hard drive um, almost five or six years ago because we uh, thought like, all right, the hard times is going well. What is another scene that is not being, you know, fed this uh this sort of comedy and gaming is so huge i mean you sell out stadiums doing e-gaming at this point and uh so we started hard drive it was initially an idea that like matt and i came up with in like a meeting you know hard times editorial meeting we pinpointed a couple of hard times writers that are well suited for that you know genre and they've they've kind of had it take off on their own. Like I base, I really have nothing to do with hard drive. They are their own entity. They are their own editorial staff. They do everything. Uh, and yeah, they, they just crush it on so many levels. Did you see that onion has an onion gamers network now? Do you think maybe they were inspired by you as you were inspired by them? That was a discussion. Uh, cause I think that came out about a year or two after hard drive was around and was becoming popular and you never know like the onion, I don't know their corporate structure. Maybe that had been something in their five year plan and it just happened to be, we beat them to it. But at the same time, it just looked at like, Oh, you guys are trying to get in on this, this market too, because you, the onion had been doing onion sports, which I don't think ever really took off, but you know, that's because sports fans don't want you to make if you're a patriots fan they don't want you to make fun of the patriots and if you do it pisses people off so like sports are tough to satirize because you almost have to do it like each individual team has their own voice you know you can't do a general sports satire or else you're going to start pissing people off uh without even realizing it you know it's just like you have to be a pro yankee satire place and you can make fun of every other baseball team but you can't make fun of the yankees you know that that's it (laughs) right i wanted to ask you know some of the headlines i can see how it would really upset people like a lot of the police headlines now you said you've gotten death threats and all of that kind of thing like has anything serious ever come out of all of that um not not from the the police stuff there's a lot of people that that comment you know then you look at that it's a private profile where they're following, you know, 1200 people and they have two followers and you're like, okay, <laughs> like, I don't know what, what you are, but, um, r- really, I, I, I haven't had anything where anybody's ever confronted me in person, uh, or anything like that, but yeah, it's a lot of, I don't know. It's uh, the, the punk and hardcore scene becomes so weird at this point, like, cause most of the people I think are not from punk and hardcore that are coming in and commenting on things, telling us to kill ourselves. They just happen to see it on their discover page or something like that. And it pissed them off. But then when it is somebody that's like, like a, like a punk or something like that, and you're like, wait, you're, you're pro cop, you know, like, what are we, what the fuck are you talking about? You loser, you know? And, <laughs> but then they're also like, it, it's this weird thing where they're, they're the anti-government in the sense of like, oh, I'll never take the vaccine because that's a government thing. But they're like, we need law and order. Like the cops are there to protect us. And like, all right, make up your mind. You know, cops are government workers, uh, you dork. Um, but yeah, I, I thankfully nobody's ever uh, doxed me or come to my house in Los Angeles and tried to beat me up over any of our anti-cop stuff. But we will continue to be anti-cop because everybody should be anti-cop. There you go. Yes. My favorite headline I've seen recently is uh, Cop Shoots Klansman in Suicide. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That one is actually that's, one that so got that's taken unbelievably down. unbelievably good. Yeah. That one got taken down on Instagram for a bit uh, and was one we had to fight for. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that one was very popular for us. And I, I did not go through and read the comments on that one because I'm sure it is a cesspool. <laughs> is it back up now? Um. 
It might be that that one was posted a little while ago, so I'd have to scroll back and, and see. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Maybe that one's due for a, a reposting soon. So is the hard times all you do now? I mean, ter- in terms of like a job, are you still working at a warehouse somewhere? Uh, no. In um, let's see, what's in 2019? It became my full time job. Um, I was work when we moved to Los Angeles, my wife and I was once again, we moved, uh, with having no prospects, no jobs or anything like that. Hard times was popular, but I was still, still a side thing. And I was working in a hardware store and then we just kind of decided like, all right, let's, let's take a risk. We'll put me full time. We'll start putting out more content. We'll see how it works. And then we ended up getting bought by a bigger company called Project M. They also own St. Vitus. Um, and they do Revolver and uh, Brooklyn Vegan as well. So we're part of a uh, small group of websites. And yeah, it's my full-time job. I collect a paycheck uh, every two weeks. Uh, and I've been able to just uh, grow the hard times through uh, through what we got going on now. That's amazing. So you just keep producing content and then you get the paycheck from Project M. Is that how it works? Yeah. And the, the, the biggest change that we had, which isn't really that much of a change anyway, because all online publications sell merch, was kind of just like pushing more merch. Like even like with, with Iodine, we did a couple of, you know, exclusive variants that we put through our merch store. And that's a big driver of revenue it's like uh you know as of the recording right now tomorrow we have two military gun um variants coming out that will probably sell out pretty fast uh and that's the big driver of revenue so we do like television shows have commercials in between breaks we have merch posts in between articles and we try to only stock things that we think people will actually want to buy as opposed to just you know, pushing, I don't know, vitamins or something that will make you look younger, you know, and just being like, all right, take these instead. So, um, right. You know, that's, that's our kind of our biggest revenue driver is just the, the hard times merch store. Who makes those decisions? Do you look at all this stuff and approve the variants or the things that are going to be posted? I'm, I'm part of the decision making, but I'm not the final arbiter of it. Like we, since we have Revolver, Brooklyn Vegan, Metal Edge, and like one other thing, um, Goldmine, uh, it's we have a guy that's like a full time dedicated person that has relationships with record labels, and I'm not sure if record labels reach out to him when pitch him on ideas, or if he reaches out to them. It's probably a mix of both, but they'll eventually be like, "Hey, we have a, you know." Uh, 200 of these turnstile things that we can do on, you know, pink vinyl. Do we want it? It's like, yes, that will sell out in two seconds. So let's go ahead and do that. And uh, so that's, there is a decision on that where, you know, I think I was actually kind of upset like a couple of years ago where it w- there was a Thursday full collapse thing that we passed on. I was like, oh, the hard times audience would have bought all of the Thursday full collapse reissues. We should have done that, you know, but uh, they, they passed on it without consulting me. Uh, and uh, we probably lost out on a couple bucks there, but not a big deal. Right. It happens. Yeah. How do people get paid? Like freelancers writing articles? Are you doing any accounting or is this all set up somewhere else? I'm I'm like fascinated by the mechanics of this whole thing. So you're asking the the a question that uh is is actually quite an, an interesting story here. So Matt, the co-founder of Hard Times, um he the one that had the idea for the Hard Times in general, posted on Facebook. He would handle, for the longest time, he handled all the business end of the hard time stuff. So people would write him at the end of the month saying, I wrote these, these headlines. Can you pay me for these? You know, and we would pay them our rate at the time. So Matt has also been in the world of freelance writing for a long time. It's what, where he came up. He was a journalist and he dealt with this all the time of like, he'd write something for Rolling Stone and then 90 days later would write Rolling Stone and say, Hey, where's my $300? So. He was sick of that, so he created a platform called Outvoice, which is basically how we pay all of the Hard Times contributors and how a lot of publishers are now paying their contributors was this thing he designed to fix a problem at Hard Times. And now that's his full-time job is running Outvoice, which is a system to pay freelancers almost immediately upon their article being published so nobody has to invoice anymore. It's just 
okay, this person wrote this article for the hard times. I'm hitting publish and I'm also hitting pay them immediately. So they get their rate and the hard times article goes live and everybody, it's a very simple process. Nobody has to write a letter. Nobody has to do invoicing at the end of the month. It all just uh, takes care of itself as long as there's money in the hard times bank account, which uh, thankfully there always has been. We haven't uh, screwed anybody as far as I know. That's pretty incredible. See, we are again smashing capitalism by designing this system to instantly pay people and not play this game of, okay, it's one year after you wrote the article. Maybe we'll pay you. Maybe we won't. Right. Because that, that happens. Anybody that's worked in freelance writing knows that that is a, a problem and it's still a problem. And if you're a freelancer and uh, these, these companies are screwing you, then you, you demand that they sign up for outvoice that's what you got to do and uh and you can you can email matt at outvoice.com and he will he will he will yell at them for you amazing wow that's pretty incredible he created a whole platform just for the hard times and now it's becoming this greater thing yeah yep and i think i mean i can't speak for him but i know like they've worked with some of the bigger name publishers i i i I think Rolling Stone might be one of them. I'm not sure, but there are some big name publications that now use that platform in order to just pay their freelancers. It, I mean, I'm sure it makes you know the person that works in the HR department or whatever department the accounts payable their their life easier. They can focus on other things rather than each and every person emailing them to say, "Where's my forty five dollars." Wow. So, Bill, what do we have coming up? What can we look forward to? from the hard times well let's see coming up shortly in the the very near future i'm going to dip my toe back in the the podcasting world i've taken a little bit of a break but uh recently i interviewed uh tony hawk uh skateboarder some people might know Ooh. also video game uh magnate tony hawk and uh so i've got a new podcast that i'm going to start up talking to people about the people that have been involved in the pro skater games uh whether they were skateboarding or band bands that played uh had their songs in there and all that stuff so that will be a new podcast that i'll probably do monthly i you know i i I don't have all that time to do weekly at this point so we'll we'll take that one slow but the tony hawk interviews in the can now i just got to start stacking some more uh behind it so that's that's the probably the big news everything else is kind of just you know the hard time instagram page stays consistent go there buy merch because that's what keeps the lights on so yeah new podcast that's exciting no more hard times podcast now i know hard times has a quite a few podcasts under its belt but i saw that the hard times podcast hasn't posted in a while yeah matt and i both got pretty busy you know him with his other endeavors and when you know you know how the these the concept of like induced demand where it's like uh, you build a 12 lane highway in Houston to reduce traffic but then there's still traffic on that highway it's kind of one of those things of you think you have this time and then uh you fill it with space and then all of a sudden it's like okay well this is cutting into other things i need to be doing so we had to make some uh some hard decisions cut things and uh, the hard times podcast just happened to be one of them it wasn't uh, we weren't as passionate about it and uh, it became a little bit of a chore so we're just like all right let's just uh let's just end it and uh we'll do we'll do things that make us happy podcasting is a tough gig a lot of people think it's easy because oh i just get a microphone and i talk into it and then i can do something now you can do that like you can just do that and then throw it up on a, a platform but it won't be good there's a lot of preparation that goes into it, Bill, and you know because you've been doing it a long time. Yeah, you know it. It it does seem like one of those things. Like, oh, anybody can do that, and yes, anybody can do that. But there's a difference between when you're listening to a bad podcast, you know it's a bad podcast. Like, okay, there's there's no the host isn't using a microphone. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? You know, like <laughs> what what is this? And then. And then, yeah, there's there's five minutes of dead space in the middle of it uh, because something went wrong. Like, you know, it, editing takes time. Even just making a post on Instagram, yeah, it takes five minutes. But maybe that five, like that five minutes, there's a lot that goes into that. So each each thing, like, it just takes time. It's a little bit 
that adds on. And that's what podcasting is. It's a bunch of small jobs. And the biggest one is just talking to the person you're talking to. But there's so many tiny jobs that if you were to explain podcasting to somebody, you might even forget that until like you're doing it and it's taking up your time. I forgot about it until right now when you said that. Like I'm talking to you and that's all I'm thinking about. And then my mind went to three YouTube accounts, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Reels, TikTok. And I'm like, oh man. Right. Asking me to send you the the, the photo you need of me to promote it because I haven't sent that yet. And then fo- even this that follow-up email, it's like, this takes time. And now my brain is in a different area and now I won't <laughs> be able to get back to that thing. Uh, and yeah, sometimes dealing with guests can be like herding cats where you're just like... Uh, Okay, or, or can you send me this one fucking thing I need, or I'm going to lose it? Uh, but you have to be polite all the time uh, because that's just the way it is. Yeah, you know, when I was growing, uh, I used to take things a lot more personally because I didn't understand the whole business and I didn't fully understand that the world doesn't revolve around me. But now I realize that nobody, including yourself, Bill, no one owes me anything. So I have to be happy with what I get. And I can always make do. Yeah, that's that was a big lesson we learned at the hard times where it's like, all right, so even when it was my, I mean, right now it's my full-time job, but nobody else should ever be as invested in the hard times as I am because nobody, it's nobody else's full-time job. So if somebody's late on an article, I can't email them and be like, listen, fuck face, this, your <laughs> deadline was two days ago. You know, what the hell? You're fucking me over. And it's like, no, no, no. This person has a full-time job. They might have a kid. They might play in bands. Like, yeah, get it to me when you can, but just know I'm waiting on it, you know? But, but, but it, don't don't kill yourself because at the end of the day, I can always write it myself. It'll take me 25 minutes to to draft a, a an article around it, and then I'll send it off to one of the other editors and they can punch it up. You know, it's 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 not the end of the world, but yeah, sometimes you get in the mindset of like, this is my thing. Everybody else has to be just as passionate, but they're not. They have their own life to live. That's why I work alone now. You know, I used to have a co-host, but he's got a wife and three kids, so he wasn't able to keep up with it anymore as this thing was growing. And I, I don't ever want to bring somebody into that again because I can get into that mindset, Bill, where I'm like, no, like you can't be one minute late. You have to be on it. You have to be prepared. And nobody's going to take it as seriously as I do. Nobody. Yeah. It, it, and, and they shouldn't because if they did, it, it would be kind of weird, you know, and be like, hey, <laughs> hey, psycho, like what the hell, you know, like uh, you, tr- you coming from my job? When you were coming up with Matt, did you guys ever get into it? Like uh, maybe uh, one person was more passionate about something else or there was just a, a disconnect in how and ideas or something like that? You know, we've actually always had a pretty good relationship because the division of labor was always kind of well established where he was a Matt is a funny person, but like he is not he would never consider himself a comedian in a way that I would like label myself that. So there was like a a hard times business side of things where he would handle that. Like if there was an advertiser, I would never talk to them. But at the same time, if there was a problem with uh, a freelancer, you know, turning in a bad draft, he would never have to edit that draft. You know, it's like, I'm going to edit this piece of shit that they turned in, but you deal with, you know, this headache over here. So we, we had a a very good division of labor that always allowed us to, uh, to work pretty seamlessly. I I can't really think of a time where him and I ever had a major disagreement that that led to us being like, that this guy's a fucking moron. You know, (laughs) we've always been uh, pretty much on the same page. That's probably why it's such a success. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, obviously everybody has an ego, but I think we're able to put ours aside when dealing with each other in that sense where, you know, um, there's, there's never a time, I don't know if you watched uh, welcome to Chippendales that was on Hulu by any chance that, uh, can, no. uh, it's, uh, it's the story of Chippendales, you know, the, 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 the male strip club and the downfall was the insane ego of the, the guy that created it almost by accident. And then the creative genius that kind of drove all the shows he could never, uh, he was always jealous of that person ended up having him murdered, you know, like they ended up in murder. Oh it was, it was that bad, but that's kind of the thing. Like Matt and I, I, I feel at least on my side, uh, I can't speak for him, but I feel we've always been able to put our egos aside and be like, yeah, this is for the best. This is for the product. This is not either of us. The hard times is not Bill Conway. The hard times is not 
Matt Sankum. We have a bunch of freelancers that take pride in what the Hard Times puts out, and we want to continue to have them want to write for us so we don't put out, you know, trash that's, uh, you know, all of a sudden like, yeah, we are endorsing uh, Kevin McCarthy for a Speaker of the House. You know, it's like, no, no, no. Uh, we're <laughs> we're not going to do that or take some heel turn like in wrestling. We just want uh, we want what's best for the hard times and its continued uh, success. That's the exact attitude you need. Putting ego aside will always serve you. Because if you're like, no, th- this is my vision and everyone has to do it exactly like I say, you're just going to end up alone. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, if if people can't work with you, then yes, you will end up working alone. And that that's all there is to it. And you, you can't do it alone most of the time. Everybody that thinks they're self-made, um, there's you, you just, you had the help of so many people, whether you realize it or not. Exactly. So since the hard times is so big now, do you have do you get offers like that? Like, hey, uh, this government organization wants you to say something good about this candidate or anything like that? Thankfully, no. I think uh, we have set ourselves up in a way of having some extreme views that turn people off. Um, it turns, you know, it makes the right people laugh. It makes the uh, pisses off some people, but it's it's almost to the detriment sometimes where there's been like collaborations where it's like, Hey, we want to work on this merch thing. And then they'll be like, we're a brand that is kind of involved like that, but you've done too much of this style that, you know, we can't uh, put our name on this because we're afraid that we might get backlash. So, you know, in a weird way, the hard times might almost, I, I think it's pretty benign most of the time, you know, like, but to some people it's, uh, it's an extreme view, but I'm, I don't know. I'm a vegan straight edge guy. I'm, a, I'm an extremist in a lot of ways, you know? So, uh, those, those sorts of things don't, uh, I, I don't think about them as much as, uh, somebody that's trying to toe the line, I guess. Uh, I, I don't know how else to put it. Have you always been straight edge? Yeah, I've, I've never, uh, I'm technically gold star straight edge. If you want to, I've never drank a sip of alcohol or smoked a, a thing i'm 38 years old uh and yeah uh started claiming edge when i was 12 never have never uh looked back you know it's now i'm at a point where it'd be very weird if i started like like oh i have wine now I'd be like what? what the fuck that's weird <laughs> no you saved yourself a lot of trouble i did everything from age 18 to 35 and then I was going to die. So now I'm straight edge by necessity. Mm, all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a good reason. You know, uh, not dying is always probably the, uh, the number one uh, reason to not, to not uh, continue on a, a certain lifestyle. Yeah. That was, that's pretty high on my list of things to do, not die. And it, <laughs> it, it's going great so far. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can tell by the fact that you are speaking, responding, and uh, it seems like you are not dead. <laughs> uh, well, Bill. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, I'm a fan of the hard times, as many are. And uh, a reminder to everybody listening, go to hardtimes.net and pick up some merch. Help Bill out here. He needs it. He wants it. Right, Bill? I I need a new yacht. You know, like the thing is, the yacht I have right now from my online publishing money is in disrepair, you know? So let's uh, buy more merch and so I can get that Bezos yacht, baby. Yeah, I mean, come on. Like he has the one yacht that's just for like, you know, pedestrian friends, though, you know, you have, we needed the nicer yacht for like the higher, for like the richer friends, right? Exactly, exactly. I have a reputation to uphold and I'm trying to buy a football team within the next five years. So come on, buy some more merch uh, over at thehardtimes.net and, and bring my dreams of owning a national football team uh, to come true. Please, we beg of you. So Bill, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And there you have it, Bill Conway. Excellent, excellent conversation. There was a lot of great stories in there. And you know what, Trevor? He reminded me of what a nightmare doing stand-up comedy is. Oh, God. I mean, yes. God, I, I do not look back on those days very fondly. I I can't really imagine it. And I when I hear stories of people doing stand-up and it doesn't go well, I get physically 
queasy. It does something to me physically. Just hearing about someone bombing, you know what I mean? And that's part of it. Like you, you have to have an iron constitution as a person to do that because bombing is part of it. Like, like I was talking about with Bill, I didn't realize you're supposed to be out there like every night, every club, every chance you can get in front of a mic, trying things out. Does this work? Does this not work? I would go to like one open mic a week and I would usually be drunk and I wouldn't remember anything that I did and I wouldn't put that much work into it. It's a, it's a craft like anything else. And you just have to be out there and be focused. And Bill did that and look at everything he's done with the hard times. I mean, I loved hearing about like uh, some of the behind the scenes and the pitches and how people get indignant about how they want something to be, but it gets shot down. And and just uh, that whole platform that Matt has built to make sure that writers get paid right away. So it's not this bullshit freelance thing where you know, you're waiting months and months to get paid. They're doing really awesome things over there. Yeah, uh, that was really interesting how they how they were talking about and I can't remember the name of the platform it has escaped my mind. But the fact that they out of necessity came up with their own platform to pay their freelancers is like, when you think about like the hard times, like, obviously, it started by people coming up from like punk hardcore scene, the whole DIY kind of aspect of it all. It's like pretty apparent that like, that's still part of like their like DNA with the hard times, like they saw a problem with like, you know, billing and all that stuff. And they were just like, screw it, we're just gonna like, make our own shit to fix it. And now that is its own separate thing that I would assume they've got like other people buying into this other platform. It's, you know, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Matt has taken that and running with it now. It's like a whole separate gig for him now. Yeah. What he was talking about, how they kind of started off on more on Facebook Yeah, and like people pitching ideas on Facebook and how (laughs) Facebook would essentially anytime any type of like uh, controversial topic came up, you know, Facebook flagged it or or kind of shadow banned them or whatever. Said that the move off of Facebook onto Slack. That's very interesting. I did I hear him right? Did he say that they've got two hundred freelance writers writing for them? I think I heard that. Yeah, yeah. something like that. That's a good insane. group of them. That is. Yeah, that's a lot. That's like to try to man. And I'm sure like everyone that's writing is just like constantly throwing stuff into that slack and then they've got to like weed through it all make sure it's not something that's like been used before i know he mentioned that one thing the mcelvoy brothers had already done which is funny because i actually listened i don't listen they've got a couple podcasts they listen they they do one podcast where they play dungeons and dragons with their dad which is pretty funny but (laughs) it sounds like their their followers are like i mean it makes sense they if they're like playing dungeons dragons their followers are like super nerdy with like their comedy and and really like kind of came after the hard times for for stealing this one joke did he say that they took that down or they left it up i can't remember i think they took it down yeah i also appreciate that he said he's still vegan straight edge that made me happy because people that are vegan or straight edge in general are seen as kind of like joyless souls who don't have a sense of humor. But you know, here's a guy who is making a career out of like satire or comedy, whatever you want to call it. And he's, you know, almost 40 years old and still vegan and straight edge. I'm 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 excited to hear that. And he also still skates. That's right. I, I had to give up skating way before 40, that's for sure. Your knees are hurting you? Uh they're okay now. That's why I started mountain biking. Because I couldn't, I see. couldn't skate anymore. Well, that was a fantastic conversation. So thank you so much, Bill, for coming on the show. Now, Trevor, let's talk about our favorite subject, us. Yes. How are we doing now? Trevor, here's what I want to do. In the spirit of PowerPoint, your former band, I wanna I wanna give the people a rundown of your scene resume. Now, you were a bass player of Albany Straight Edge Band Solstice, yes? Uh, they were actually from Syracuse. Um, oh. Yeah. See, Albany and Syracuse to me are like the same thing, it, even though it, yes. they, they're not. Uh, they were they were from Syracuse. I And I was never actually an official member of that band. I really just kind of stepped in. So their bass player was like notoriously flaky. And 
a guy that I knew from Albany was in, he played guitar in Solstice. He would travel to Syracuse for practices or whatever. He asked me if I wanted to basically be like the second string bassist for when their bassist didn't show up to shows. So like I went on tour with them because their bass player couldn't go on tour. And then like they started doing like more shows when they got back and they'd be like, hey, our bass player didn't show up. Do you still remember the songs? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. Oh, so we're going to say you're a member then. Like I played one fill-in show with This Day Forward on bass. I'm a, I'm a member you as far are. as I'm yes. concerned. Yeah. And you were the singer of Shogun out of Denver, right? Hmm? Correct. Uh, at least the the early iteration of that band until they kicked me out. <laughs> What'd you get kicked out for? Oh, boy. Well, essentially, I was a couple years older than everybody else in that band they were all still in college and I, I was like out of college for a couple of years. So I was in like in a very different place in life. You know, like the difference between like a 23 year old and a 20 year old is huge. So basically they wanted a tour nonstop and I was like, uh, I've got a job and I got bills and you know, that whole thing. So they threw your ass out. They threw me out. And then they got way more popular after they threw me out. And you played various instruments in the band PowerPoint. Now, PowerPoint, of course, was the famous office-themed hardcore band where members would be promoted mid-set. So you could be playing bass and suddenly be promoted to vocalist. Not only that, we had a branch office. So this was, we were, the I was in the Newark version. We had a branch office in Denver Five other dudes, also calling themselves PowerPoint, played the same songs. We would kind of co-write songs, and then they would just play shows in Denver, and then we would play shows on the East Coast. And I always wanted to do like a mega show where all of us all got together, but that just didn't really didn't really pan out. That's pretty brilliant. Yeah, we had we there were other people that contacted. There were some people like in Florida, were like, "Hey, we want to do like a, a Florida division," but they didn't really have much follow through. So. Didn't work out. <laughs> Imagine if you incorporated all across the country, that would have been huge. Yeah. Um, we could have made tens of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Trevor is creator of Chainslap. If you haven't followed them on Instagram, follow them at, at Chainslap News. Chainslap is like the onion or the hard times, correct. but in the world of cycling, correct? Uh, just mountain biking, but yes. And fun fun fact about Chainslap, you were the very first follower of Chainslap. <laughs> I think, really? Yeah, because I think you started up the podcast, or at least the Instagram version of the podcast, right around the same time yes. that I started Chainslap. And I think we followed e each other kind of immediately, and you were the very first person to follow Chainslap. Yes, and you, I love that. And you don't really care about mountain biking at all, and that's great. I love it. <laughs> I support my friends. Yes. That is what I yes. do. That's your main creative gig now, right? That is my my creative outlet. Uh, yes, yeah. You know, basically, I got into mountain biking later in life. As I said before, my knees kind of not happy with me still trying to like be a teenager and skate anymore. So I had to find something else to do with my time. Uh, kind of just you know got into mountain biking kind of casually, and then it really kind of just became the the main thing I, I do with my spare time. But mountain biking, just like any other hobby, sport, music team, whatever it is, you know, just becomes everyone splitting up into their little camps and then arguing with each other. <laughs> and it's just funny to me. Like it's grown adults who ride bicycles, <laughs> who get angry at each other for like, you know, kind of bike that they ride or like where they ride or, you know, it's just so silly. And, you know, I saw, you know, like I, I followed the hard times for a while and it just kind of hit me one day. I was like, Oh, I should do like a hard times type thing, but about mountain biking, which I hadn't seen. It's probably out there. I'm sure, you know, there's like a million like meme type accounts on like yeah. mountain biking but I hadn't seen anything that was like more like satire, like fake news and like memes. Let me, I'm going to go on a tangent just about memes in general. I don't like the word memes. I don't <laughs> find like 99.9% .9 of memes humorous at all. Like it's just such like co lowest common denominator type of humor that just doesn't, doesn't appeal to me. And like, I get people that message me on Chase Lab. They're like, Oh, what a, 
this is like a funny meme. You should do like a meme about whatever. I'm like, I don't do memes. I do satire. Memes are like, and there's like a ton of them, you know, for like mountain biking, but it's like, it'll say something like, oh, when you're when your foot slips off your pedal and it hits you in the shin. And then there's like a picture of like, you know, SpongeBob like screaming and then it has like 10,000 likes. I'm like, this is nonsense. This is total bullshit. It's not funny at all. And I wanted to do something like a little different. So that's how, that's how I started doing chain slap. I don't know if I'm always as funny as I think I am, but I keep doing it because I keep having ideas (laughs) to, to put out there. It's getting some good traction. I think you have more followers than me now. Hold on. Let's check. Let's do it. All right. All right. I'm at, uh, hold on. Let's switch to the right account. I'm at 4225 and Trevor is at 8261. Whoa. How'd you get up that high? Did you buy any followers? Yes. Uh, <laughs> but a lot. No, no, of course not. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Like, I don't put any, I don't put any money. I don't do any of the, like the paid promoted posts or anything. I just put my stuff out there. I, I'll be honest. I haven't fully understood how this whole algorithm works on Instagram. Like sometimes things really take off like with hashtags and sometimes they don't do anything. It always seems to be the thing like, uh, so by what I do for actual work is I do create I am like a graphic designer basically by trade. So I have that skill set where I can like make, you know, cool things visually for chain slap, but it's always the things if I put more time into something visually and I and I think it's like funny and I put it out there, it's those are the things that nobody cares about. <laughs> like I did a whole thing uh, uh, like around the holidays around a like it's called the chain slap holiday gift guide and I made it I made up like fake like mountain bike type products that I like photoshopped and I made it all designy like something you see on like Pinterest and like nobody cared. <laughs> it's like one of the worst like responses that anything I've put out there. But then like something where I just like throw something together in like two seconds, it like takes off. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Like, you know, the podcast is the podcast. I, I post it every week, no matter what. And that is what it is. But I've done some gaming content and I, I know what you're saying because some content, like I sit and meticulously edit things together and kind of make a story and a whole visual presentation. And those clips always do poorly. And then other times I'll just take a clip direct from my Twitch stream and post that. And a couple of those have gone viral. Well, for me anyway, I'm talking like 25,000 views. So it's weird. I don't understand how it works. I don't know what's funny and what's not, I guess. It's just, uh, who knows? I think it's sort of the nature of social media at this point and what appeals to what target audience. I I always thought when I started Chain Slap, it would mostly be like older, older guys like myself who are into mountain biking. And I quickly found out it's like a lot of like younger, like kids would follow me. And I think like the stuff that I do that I think appeals to that like more like 40 and over crowd, like the younger people are just not getting at all. <laughs> like they just don't get it. They're not understanding my my references or whatever it is. So, you know, I think it's really more the the target demographic. Like like gaming, like again, I'm going to assume that's like a younger audience, you know. Yes. I had uh hundreds of people telling me that I suck and that why am I aiming like that and you're horrible. But the point of the clip is that I'm horrible. They all miss the joke. Uh-huh. And I, I found I found myself like going through the comments and I was starting, I was about to like reply to people and be like, you idiot. It's supposed to be, but then I was like, wait, maybe I shouldn't be yelling at kids. Like, right. why don't we just let this one go? That That's another thing. Like if I get, and it happens very rarely, but if I get some kind of comment that is, I don't know, trying to attack what I've, me in some way because I've posted whatever, I always take a second to see who it's coming from. And I'm like, I'm not going to, this is like a 16 year old kid. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything back to him. I'm just going to let it go. But if it's like, if it's like someone who looks like they're like older, I, I don't even engage. I just like, like I posted something recently. I don't remember what post it was, but someone started posting like super, like someone started posting like quasi sort of racist kind of stuff. And then another person came in and was like straight racist. And I was like, I'm not even going to like 
say anything to these people. I'm not going to engage in any way. They're just gone, blocked, deleted, just gone. That's good. Yeah. If there was anything like that on my page ever, I would just delete it. It hasn't happened. It better not happen or you'll be gone. There's your warning. There There you go. go. Trevor, we uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. You and I actually played music together we for did. a minute. Do you remember that? I do. Uh, what I remember about it was we pra- we would practice in not even Philly, like con- Concha, Manioc. Right? like kind of pat. Like so, I'm in Central Jersey, so I would have to like go like basically past Philadelphia to practice. And I at the time was working in New York, so I would commute home oh, God. on the train, like grab grab my gear, hop in the car, and then go down to Maniunk, and then we would practice. I mean, this was... Uh, 2008? Two, right. Okay. So I was yeah. young enough at the time where like I could still do that and wake up in the morning and go to work. But as I recall, we started like cycling through drummers. Yep. <laughs> like I think we hit like the third drummer and I yeah. was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Like it feels like we keep <laughs> starting over. <laughs> and I liked it. it. We had a, you know, I thought we had some good stuff going. I was just like, I can't, I can't keep doing that. Cause I would get home at like one thirty in the morning, have to be up at six and get the train back to New York. Uh, it was rough, but, uh, you know, you guys continued on without me. You got a new bass player. You put out some good stuff. You you guys played with uh, rival schools. Rival schools. That's right. I almost said quicksand. Rival schools. That was a good one. Yeah. You know, uh, the band we're talking about is Crash of sixty four. It's a band of mine. I've mentioned on the show before. It had several members of All Else Failed and myself and uh, Mike from Backwoods Payback uh, on vocals. Give it a listen if you haven't yet. Trevor, do you know? My favorite song from, I go back and forth on that record. Sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, these songs aren't good. Some are good. Some are not. I don't know. I do that with everything I'm involved in though. But the first song on that EP, day, day, slash month, month, slash year, 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 year. Do you know the the melodic break in that song where it's just the guitar lead? Do you know that was your idea? Do you remember that? That vaguely sounds familiar. Yes. I haven't thought about it in 14 years, but yeah, that is sounding correct. We were at practice and like, there's the lead and then there's this break. And I remember you pointing to me and you're like, he should just be doing that during this part That's and nothing right. else. That's right. And I was like, yes, it should just be me. I always say that. I'm, I'm just, just trying to give you the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you you came up with that part for that song. Yeah, no, that was, that was a fun band. Uh, just, you know, unfortunately didn't work out. I, I live. I, li- I live too far from everything. You know what I mean. You were really good too. Like you're a good bass player. You had great gear. Like it. It would have been it. Well, listen, we're out of time. That's yeah. it. That's all we've got. Or we have more, but uh, we are bound by contractual obligations to only provide a certain number of minutes in each episode. Right. It's the the podcast bylaws. That's the way it goes. But listen, Trevor. It was good to catch up with you. You know, you owe me a full lunch because Trevor big time me uh, last time we hung out, everybody. We met up for lunch. That's right. And then uh, in the middle of lunch, he's like, oh, I have to go. I have an important call. And then he left me at the table. I threw down that uh, that American Express black card and I was like, keep the change, kid. <laughs> so next time, uh, full lunch. We have to. All right. Let's do it. All right. So Trevor, thank you for co-hosting this episode with me. It was it was very nice catching up. Same to you. All right, and that's it for this episode. But I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks everybody for listening and until next time.